Bill, I am so excited to chat with you today. Sarah, it's great to see you again. It's been too long. I know. I was actually thinking about that today of how, how long it's been, because it feels like yesterday, but it's been almost like four or five years since we've been in the same room or had conversations. Yeah, you know, when we spent, we did spend a lot of quality time together. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, when, when we were at, at Penn State, and obviously both of us have gone in different directions since then, successfully, you know, um, for you anyway. I don't know, <laughs> oh, I mean. my gosh. Are um, you kidding me? And yeah. you're now an AD at St. Thomas? Like, that's that's a pretty big deal. It's been a wild ride. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. been a wild ride. Yeah. So, you know, as we hop on and have this conversation, I recall like you and I chatting about your athletic days and playing baseball. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about that experience and how that led you to even working in college athletics? Yeah. Well, you know, I grew up the son of a college coach, right? My mm -hmm. dad coached cross country and track at the University of Wisconsin lacrosse. So I was always around it. Um, and I, you know, I was a high school athlete or whatever. And, you know, a story that not a lot of people know. Um, I was actually headed to the University of Wisconsin Madison to play baseball. And in the senior, my senior year, the spring of my senior year, they dropped baseball. Wow. And so I scrambled a little bit and had been, you know, had conversations with a couple of other schools. And so I ended up at the University of St. Thomas, um, which is where I am today and, and played baseball. And that was an in interesting journey. Also, I had, um, you know, one coach for three years. I actually ran track for a year too. Oh, I um, not a lot of people know that either. I got injured <laughs> my sophomore year and I threw the javelin on the track team, but one coach for three years and then he retired at the end of my junior year. And, and, you know, they brought in a new coach, uh, Dennis Denning, who turns out to just be one of the best, le you know, the biggest legends in, in college baseball at any division. Yeah. Um, and that really, I think, you know, Sarah put me in the mindset, both the experience I had with my dad and, you know, the experiences that I had so many different experiences as a collegiate athlete and that the impact that we have on kids <clears throat> and the fact that, you know, our student athletes go on to become hopefully better wives and mothers and husbands and fathers and business people and community mm -hmm. leaders and civic leaders because of their experience in athletics is what kind of motivated me to want to continue my life yeah. uh, in, in college athletics. So, you know, a lot of really good memories um, as a student athlete, um, you know, was just actually home last weekend celebrating my dad's 80th birthday and He's got a track meet named after him. Actually, funny story. If you Google Phil Esten, you're going to get a whole bunch of track results. Oh, yeah. From the Phil Esten Invitational track meet. And people ask me all the time, like, how did you get a track? His name is Phil Esten. Also, I'm junior. How'd you get a track meet named after you? And, and I you know, <laughs> joke and I say, you know what? I was so bad at baseball. They named a track meet after oh. me. <laughs> right? So I, um, That's hilarious because I will say, you know, as I like Google or you try to say like, I'm going to contact Phil. Oh, all of your dad's information comes up. And like, he had yeah. a pretty incredible coaching career. He did. You know, we're proud of him. He's in the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Hall of Fame. And he had really a, a, a phenomenal career as, as the head coach at lacrosse. They won a whole bunch of national championships and conference mm -hmm. championships. But I think, you know, to this day for him, what is more meaningful than all of those championships is when he gets invited to somebody's wedding mm -hmm. or he gets a notice of somebody's kid or now grandkid um, <laughs> being born. And, and he's, you know, he runs into him in, in lacrosse or somewhere else. And I can't tell you how many people have confused me for him either on Facebook or an email and just said, Hey, you know, thinking they're talking to my dad, you had such a profound impact on my life, blah, 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 blah. And, um, I think they're pretty disappointed when I email them back and say, you know, say I'm, I'm his kid, but I forwarded it on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he's, he's proud of it. We're proud of it. Uh, and, and again, it goes back to the why, the impact that, yeah. that we have on, on kids. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, that's really, truly why I do what I do is because we see, and I'm going to put you and I both in that same category. We see the potential that these student athletes have, what that they could become, because we know our sport eventually comes to an end. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the one thing that I, I think is really important is that, as you say, you know, the, the sport comes to an end and then the rest of the life, rest of life happens. Mm -hmm. And every student, regardless of whether or not they're an athlete, comes to campus and matriculates to campus looking for some kind of development opportunity. That's right. Personal development, academic development, social development, you know, emotional, spiritual development, whatever it is. 
A lot of students find that through academic clubs or social clubs or student government or the interfraternity council or whatever it might be. And we provide those development opportunities through intercollegiate athletics. And so mm -hmm. for instance, at St. Thomas, about 11% of our student population on campus are student athletes. So more than 10% of our students are finding those developmental, the developmental opportunities through intercollegiate athletics. And so our responsibility isn't just to win games and to mm -hmm. compete on the playing field or ice or court or pool or track or whatever. It is to make sure that they're prepared for whatever lies ahead once, you know, the lights go out in the gym or, um, you know, and so that, that's, that to me is, as we're looking for a bunch of new coaches here at St. Thomas, as we make this move, a really important part of the process. What is it that motivates you to coach? Um, yeah. And if a big portion of it is making sure that these student athletes are ready for whatever's next, then I think you're going to fit well at St. Thomas. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm hearing you say this as you make this big move. And I, I want everybody to know what this amazing move is that St. Thomas has made. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's been an interesting journey, Sarah. So I started about two and a half years ago. Um, and the second day that I was here, I went and met with the commissioner of our then conference, the Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, Mac. Mm -hmm. And I sat down with Dan McCain and he said, Hey, you're in for a ride. And I, and I kind of looked at him like, what do you mean? And he said, well, well you know, what's going to happen. I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. So you're, you're going to get kicked out of your conference. You're, we're going to, they're going to kick you out of the conference. I said, for what? And he said, because you're too competitive. And mm -hmm. so to put it into perspective in the last 15 years, St. Thomas across all sports has won more conference championships than all of the other 12 schools in the conference combined. Wow. Um, and so, and, and you know, when you take a look at our institutional profile, we've changed quite a bit over the mm -hmm. last 25 years, and we've grown into a more of a comprehensive university, um, liberal art with a liberal arts kind of background. Mm -hmm. And so when they asked us to leave the conference, we quickly started looking for a new home. And as a division three school, we thought our options were to find another division three conference or right. transition and, and reclassify to division two. It became kind of, um, uh, apparent to us that there may be an option to move directly to division one. So, you know, a year and some months later, after a ton of work and aligning up four different conferences for our 22 sports, uh, the NCAA granted us mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity to move directly from division three to division one without the necessary 12 year waiting period in between. Um, and so we become, we began that, that transition and, and this July 1st, we officially reclassify and, and start the reclassification process to division one. So it's been, like I said, it's been a crazy ride and then you layer COVID on top of it. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been a really challenging, challenging yeah. year. And you guys are the first institution to be able to make this big jump. That's right. Yeah. So we're the first school I'd say in modern athletics, modern day athletics, who knows what happened 40 sure. years ago, but um, we are the first school to make this move directly from Division Three to Division One, um, and you know what? It, it's exciting. We're going to be in the Summit League for the vast majority of our sports. It's a good regional conference for us. Um, it's a, I think it's a very strong conference. We'll be in the Pioneer Football League uh, with football. It's the only coast-to-coast -coast conference in the country. Right. Um, only one of two non-scholarship Division One football conferences. The other being the Ivy League. So we're keeping a company uh, from an academic perspective. Yeah. And then our two hockey teams found really nice homes for them, the women's WCHA for a women's team and, and, a, and the CCHA for a men's team. So we're, you know what, Sarah, we're excited. I, you know, it's going to be a journey for all of them. They're accustomed to winning quite a bit. Right. And so they're going to take, we're going to take our lumps in the first couple of years. Um, hopefully we don't become comfortable with that. I, and, and I think that by, you know, years four or five, we'll be able to hold our own a little bit. Sure. Um, but in the meantime, it's about building culture. It's about building a foundation for sustainable success in the future, making sure that we don't cut corners or take any shortcuts that compromises our integrity and our values. Um, so yeah, it's it's certainly an, it's a, I'm looking at it as a startup, right? It's like right. a startup company like you just went through. Yeah. Um, you know, all of the things you've got to think about to be successful in five years. What do we need to do today to get That's to right. that point? Yeah. Yeah, and you, you know, I think a lot of people here, when they think Division One, they think Power Five conference schools. Yeah. And that is not the case. And I want our students to know that, you know, the vast, like, there is such a vast array of Division One schools that students can go to. Yeah, you know, I, I think there are maybe 400 Division One schools. Yeah. 
and only 65 of them are in the power five. Right. And only 130 of them are even in BCS. And so more than half of the division one schools are in something other than what you see in terms of, excuse me, FBS, FBS football, mm -hmm. um, whether it's FCS football or, or division one competition, you know, that, that doesn't sponsor football. And, you know, I think the schools academically are extremely strong across the board. And when you think about life after sport, as we talked about there a little bit, you think about life after college, right? Um, you know, whether or not you're at an FBS or excuse me, an FBS school, a power five school or not, the impact that we have on our student athletes is equal. And yeah. so whether or not you're playing um, baseball at St. Thomas or football at Penn State, the impact on that student athlete is the same. It right. should be the same, right? And the yeah. outcome should be the same, preparing us for whatever whatever is next and, and really thinking about how we provide that platform for developmental opportunities for, for students. And, you know, with that too, a lot of these smaller division one schools provide a lot of different avenues for aid versus some other schools who maybe athletic aid is the only thing that they can provide where some smaller schools have a different opportunity. Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, in particular private schools and, mm -hmm. you know, the way that the private school financial model works a lot of times is that they've got some need-based aid, but they also have merit-based aid that helps um, from a recruiting process, but it helps get kids, um, you know, students to, to school. And so when you're looking at these opportunities, you can't factor out the academic and merit opportunities that, that somebody might have to help offset some of the expenses. And so while you may only get a couple thousand dollars on the athletic aid side, there might be a couple thousand dollars on the merit side that could, that could help as well. Yeah. And I think when we like envision this, these students who are going through high school, they're trying to navigate, like, what does this look like? You know, one of the things I work a lot with our students is starting early when they think about academics from an NCAA perspective, because there are so many rules and regulations to become that qualifier. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's important. Um, you know, my, my oldest son is going to be a freshman this year and believe it or not, we're already thinking about how his kind of academic roadmap looks mm -hmm. so that he's prepared for college and he's, and he's not going to be a division one athlete. And so even outside of that, and, and um, one of the things that I think maybe parents and some others don't understand is the academic rigor that the NCAA is now holding all schools to right. through APR, mm -hmm. um, the academic progress rate and through GSR, the graduation success rate. And so institutions, have both a carrot and a stick. And that's the way I kind of like to talk about it. With APR, if you reach, and GSR, if you reach a certain threshold, there's financial support from the NCAA. But if you hit a certain basement and fall below that, there's repercussions from an eligibility standpoint. Yeah. Um, and, and so anymore, coaches are incented to recruit student athletes that are prepared both athletically and academically to be successful at, at institutions. And so if students are not academically prepared, and somebody else is with kind of equal athletic talent, it's pretty easy to move to the person that's prepared to do both versus right. the one that's prepared to do just one. And the sooner, I, I agree with you 100%, Sarah, and you, you're uniquely positioned to have a better perspective on that than I do. But the sooner you can get after that, the better, of course. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned about your son going into his freshman year, you know, I, that's what I talk about parents, like be starting that process, whether your student is going to play division one or junior college level or NAIA, whatever that is, you have to start early and you want to aim for those division one qualifications because that will actually set you up for success on any of these other levels as well. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. And and the qualifications are pretty easy to find. Oh, exactly. Um, yep. Right. And they're not necessarily difficult to hit as long as you're looking for them. Right. And, right. and so long as you have knowledge of what they are on the front end, it's easy to work it into the roadmap throughout your four years of high school. That's right. If you wait till year three or four, and then you think about what you've got to make up, it's a lot harder to make progress on that. Right. And so think, you know, thinking about it early, as you said, whether or not you're a division one student athlete or, or anything else. It's mm -hmm. important, I think, to make that roadmap. Oh, and, and, you know, that's something I love that you call it a roadmap because that's actually what I call um, the document that I hand out and it's an NCAA eligibility roadmap. So we'll be sure to link that in the show notes. If any parents are looking at a way to make sure their students stay in on track, because it outlines that from freshman year to senior year. Yeah. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. So, you know, as I think about our students, 
we both know about the leadership qualities that come out of these student athletes as they transition from high school to college. And coaches are looking for these leadership qualities. How can students continue to build on that even at the high school level? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Again, we just went through this with our son as we were thinking about high schools for him. And where do you find moments um, to learn about accountability and moments right. to kind of gain leadership opportunities? And, you know, I, 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 interestingly, I think some people think the busier you are, the less apt you are to succeed at mm. things. I tend to think the busier you are, the more apt you are to be organized. Right. Um, <laughs> you got to be organized so that you can be successful. And frankly, I think that's why student athletes have a higher GPA than students at large. Oh, I, I 100% agree to, with you. Right. They've got to be more organized in their day and in their in their week and in their semester and just to be able to accomplish it. And so, you know, we, I encourage my kids, we encourage a lot of young people to get involved. I, yeah. I think when you get involved in things, whether it's school activities, scouts is a great place I think, yep. to get involved, to learn some of these accountability and leadership factors. To me, that's what, even getting a job, um, it, it's a right. five to 10 hour a week job at the local bike shop or at the hardware store or at wherever. Those are the things that help you gain confidence, mm -hmm. um, that help you learn to take initiative. Because, you know, I'll, I'll say this, and I don't, you know, I'm not in the business of recruiting student athletes, but right. I am in the, you know, the coaches do that. But I am in the business of hiring people. And you want to hire people that aren't going to make you have to work more, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to take initiative. They're going to see opportunity. They're going to be proactive. They're going to have confidence in certain areas, right? And those things are developed over time. And, and so when you become more active and you're exposed to more people, you're exposed to more situations, you've got to make decisions in different ways. I think the more you can get involved, Sarah, the more you develop, again, initiative, the more right. you develop confidence, the more you start to understand where your strengths are and maybe where your weaknesses are and you can lean to your strengths and, and kind of avoid some of those weaknesses. So I, 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 I think an easy, for me, an easy answer is when you're in high school, try to get involved in as much as possible. Um, and that can mean being a multi-sport athlete too. Right. You know, I do think sports, kind of the um, specialization of sport, it certainly helps you develop skills, but there's some other things you're missing, I think, if you specialize in, in certain sports. So I think just getting active, getting involved helps to kind of develop some of those things. Even more. Yeah. And I completely agree with that because we, I've seen student athletes go through, you know, their four years at private institutions, you know, power five institutions. And when they come in with those, you know, skills and the confidence that they build, it truly helps them become part of that next team that they're on with people they don't know. Yeah. Well, and that, you're, you're absolutely right about it. When you get to college, um, the leadership opportunities on your team is stepping up to volunteer for SAC, the Student mm -hmm. Athlete Advisory Council, um, wanting to get engaged in other community service opportunities, wanting to be involved in helping to develop um, a social media plan for That's your right. team, right? Those are the kids that become captains. Yep. Those are the student athletes that develop different leadership skills if they come in with a level of confidence and ability to take initiative and step up and volunteer for things. If you haven't done those things before, you got to learn how to do that. And by the time you're a senior, it's, it's in college, it's, yeah. it's too late. Yeah. And, and I think about too, like our freshmen, our sophomores of high school, when they're kind of getting into that planning of I'm trying to pick my college and they need recommendation letters, that's such a great conversation then to have with your teachers about here's all the things I have done. And then your teachers can not only speak to your academic ability, but now they're speaking to everything that you do as a whole. Yeah, you're right, sir. And on top of that, um, so many schools are moving to test optional. Yep. Right. The ACT, SAT test optional or not, you know, you don't even need to test at all. But there's got to be a way for them to evaluate That's right, uh, right um, applications some way, shape or form. And so they're going to look for this comprehensive evaluation yeah. that includes not just what you've done academically, but what you've done from an extracurricular standpoint, too. So those things are going to help put you in a position to be positively reviewed by admissions as you're going through the application yeah. process. I think that's such a great point because, you know, parents are wondering, like, how can my students stand apart? What are the things I need to be doing? And, and with that experience, you're able to say, here's all the things that I've been doing. And I have people who can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And you know what? Not every school 
through the normal curriculum is going to be able to offer you some of the leadership things and other volunteer things that you want. So you're going to have to be proactive and find them on your That's own. Right. Yeah, and, and there's really good ways that you could do that within your community by talking to your high school counselor, by talking to other teachers that are there. So as you're thinking about it, students, trying to figure out like what's going to be that next best thing for you, have those conversations. Let your teachers, your mentors, your parents know that you're looking for these opportunities and they're really easy to find in your local community. Well, and sir, I'm sure in your experience, you saw a lot of student athletes come in who came in with some of those background experiences, whether it's in um, you know, in wrestling or gymnastics or baseball or whatever those sports were. I mean, I, I would imagine you've got a lot of thoughts about what some of those opportunities would be. Yeah. And, and, you know, you guys, if you have questions on that, feel free to reach out to me and we can really find what, what are some of those areas that you can do and like how you can get involved because coaches, you know, those are conversations that coaches have with other staff members at the institution as they're looking at this recruiting process. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Yeah. Phil, so you know our podcast is called Confessions from the Sidelines. Yeah. I would love to know what is your favorite memory of standing on the sidelines? You know, I don't know that I have I don't know that I have one, but okay. I have a couple that I want to share. Oh, we um, take a couple. Yeah, let's listen um, to it. So First was my very first job in sports in college athletics was at Ohio State. Yeah, I was a GA pursuing my master's degree and showed. This is silly. This and it probably sounds a little immature, but um, showed up for the first football game and I was my GA was in ticketing and event management, and so the first football game. Frankly, I don't remember who we were playing, um, but it was sold out, right? And and it was yeah. pre Ohio Stadium renovation, so it was oh, about, okay. It was about 90,000 people. And that was the first time I had seen that many people together, um, at, oh. you know, at one, at one time. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I grew up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, a town of about 50,000 people. And my, my, I, I distinctly remember thinking you could fit my hometown in here twice. Yeah. I've had that um, thought. I've had that thought in stadiums because I grew right, up in a small yeah. town too. Yeah. And how crazy, um, that is, and that showed me pretty immediately how passionate people are about yeah. college athletics, right? There's a right. lot of passion there. Um, a second one that happens to also be football was um, my second job in college athletics was at the University of Minnesota. And one of my responsibilities was helping to build TCF Bank Stadium, which is a new football stadium. So we played off campus in the Metrodome where the Vikings played for several years, for a couple yeah. decades. And we built this beautiful new stadium right on campus, it's about a 50,000 seat stadium. And it was it was six years of hard work, um, mm -hmm. time at the legislature and corporate sponsorship and fundraising and design and construction and ticketing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, opening night, we played Air Force. And um, as I'm standing on the sidelines, there was the, the, air, the flyover. Right oh, I like, totally fire. just got chills on that. And it was at dusk and you see the skyline kind of just off into the distance and you've got Air Force standing on one side and we're standing on the other side as the national anthem is kind of completing. And I thought about all the hard work that kind of went into it, but I also thought about all of the memories that we just built that will be created in the future. Right. As a result of this stadium and the tailgating that happens and the memories on the field and and the students who are coming who are going to meet friends there and maybe, you know, husband and wives meet or whatever, like right. all the memories that we just created in the future by opening the stadium. I remember that pretty, pretty distinctly, too. Oh, what great memories of yeah. just being a part of college athletics. And that's what I love about, you know, what you do and what, what other people do in athletics, especially administration, because you provide opportunities for our student athletes to take their academic, their athletic, their personal, their, that game to the next level. And it is so empowering. Well, I appreciate that. So, you know, what, what you're doing is pretty important too. I mean, I, you, and you know that because this is a really big decision yeah. um, and there's a lot that goes into it. It's not as easy as just being the best player on your high school team, That's right? right? There's a lot that goes into it. And I think the more that people can learn and become educated about the process, the better the better position you're in to make a good decision for your future. 
Um, that's a hundred percent true. You know, I, I say that often is it's not just about being the star athlete anymore. There are so many things that go into this to become, to, to really take your athletic game to the next level. And right. you've got to be mindful of all of those things too, as you go through the process. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you, Phil, so much for being here with us today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you.